Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! My story starts when I was just out running some errands, when I stumbled upon a scene that left me shocked, but eventually satisfied in the end. I was walking around after I was running some errands, browsing through the shops on Main Street, when I noticed a blind teen girl walking down the sidewalk with her cane in her hand and her glasses on her face. For a blind person, she seemed so confident, navigating her way gracefully despite her blindness. That's what actually forced me to notice her, but little did I know that a storm was brewing just around the corner. That's when I saw her, the ultimate Karen, strutting down the sidewalk with that infamous I want to speak to your manager haircut. Karen was on a mission to ruin someone's day. Little did we know that the poor blind girl was about to become her unfortunate target. Karen, who was busy fumbling with her phone, collided with a girl and let out a dramatic gasp. Watch where you're going, witch. You almost made me drop my phone. The poor blind girl immediately apologized, saying, I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't see. And sometimes it's challenging to avoid accidents. But did that stop Karen from being unreasonable? Nope. Instead, she walked up to her and actually gave her a little shove. Find yourself a corner to sit in and never walk aimlessly on the streets again. She sneered. My jaw dropped, along with those of the other people around. This woman was beyond entitled. She was downright cruel. The blind girl handled the situation with remarkable poise and said, Ma'am, that was uncalled for. I have as much right to be here as anyone else. But Karen couldn't stand anyone challenging her authority. She turned back and slapped the girl across the face, knocking her glasses and cane away from her, causing her to stumble and fall. It was shocking and horrifying, and I couldn't believe my eyes. As a blind girl seemed to sob on the ground, Karen started screaming like a banshee, yelling all kinds of obscenities and nonsense. I swear it was like watching a real-life villain in action. But just as I thought this nightmare would never end, karma stepped in. Among the passerby, there was a man, tall and composed, with his two young daughters. He saw everything that happened and quickly sent his daughters to help the girl on the ground while he approached Karen with a calm but stern demeanor. Then he revealed himself to be a US Marshal. Without hesitation, he put Karen in handcuffs while she continued her hysterics. You're under arrest for assaulting this young girl, he said firmly. I couldn't believe it. It was my first time seeing the tables turn instantly like this. I gotta say, it's magical. While the marshal called for backup to take care of Karen, I went over to the poor girl to offer my support. She was still shaken and tearful, but feeling the kindness of strangers helping her regain her glasses and cane brought a small smile to her face. The man, who introduced himself as Marshal Dave, handled the whole situation with such professionalism and compassion. He stayed with us until another officer arrived, and Karen was taken away still screaming and protesting her innocence. Throughout all this, the girl remained gracious, and I couldn't help but be impressed by her strength. We chatted a bit while waiting for the police report to be filed, and she told me how she had been blind since birth, but I had never let it hold her back. She had dreams of becoming a musician and was working hard on her music studies. As we talked, I felt privileged to meet such a strong young woman. Once the police had all the necessary information, the girl thanked the marshal and his lovely daughters for helping her out. She was so grateful for his intervention, as were the rest of us who witnessed the whole ordeal. The marshal was humble and kind, brushing off our braids as part of his job. He made sure the girl had someone to accompany her home safely and assured us that the legal process would take its course. Later, as I was curious and ended up following the case, the girl decided to press charges against Karen for the assault. And you know what else? She took it one step further and sued Karen for the physical and emotional damage he caused. I love it. I had the chance to catch up with her after she filed the charges and she told me how she knew it wasn't just about seeking revenge. She simply wanted justice, not only for herself, but for others who might encounter entitled bullies like Karen. 
She teamed up with a good lawyer who specialized in cases involving discrimination and hate crimes. They gathered evidence, witness statements, and of course, videos from some folks who filmed the whole fiasco. And let me just tell you, the case didn't just end up being about the physical assault. Her lawyer argued that the attack was motivated by discrimination against disabled people, turning it into a hate crime case. Rightfully so, nobody should have to endure such cruelty just because of their disability. The legal process took some time, as these things often do, but Karen eventually was found guilty of felony assault with a hate crime enhancement. She was sentenced to five years in prison, and on top of it, she was ordered to pay restitution to the blind girl for the physical and emotional damage she caused. So yeah, folks, next time you see a Karen brewing up some trouble, Remember this story and be the difference that you want to see. This story happened a few years ago while employed as a police officer in a small rural 15-man department. Since being a cop, I've never had a strong desire to write tickets. Typically, my limit was 15 miles per hour over before I would even consider issuing a citation, and that might result in a 5-over ticket. 10-over, and we'll get a warning. I tended to focus on impaired and slash or uninsured drivers. In the town was a lone stretch of roadway, a couple of miles leading straight to the nearest interstates. Using this road might take a few minutes off your commute to home slash work depending on the time of the day. The road had a couple of very old homes which had a comfortable distance from the roadway. Speed limit was 55, but not uncommon to see drivers going 15 over. We rarely got complaints. Unfortunately, one summer we had an O2 pedestrian fatal accident. A driver was on their way to work in the early hours and hit a small child who wasn't supervised by their crabby parents. Speeding wasn't a factor in the tragedy. Following that tragedy, an order was given that we needed to seriously enforce speeding in the area. The next following weeks, I stop anyone going over the speed limits, even one mile per hour over. Now, I still keep to my normal method of issuing tickets, meaning your speed needs to be excessive to get a ticket from me. Most of these stops consisted of me informing them of the tragedy and the importance of all of us driving more slowly. Most drivers are understanding and see what I'm trying to do here, except a few who filed complaints for stopping cars for one mile per hour and inconveniencing them. I get told to tune back on my proactive enforcement and just to be more visible. Great. Instead of looking for bigger issues or interacting with the community, they want me to just sit in my car. So for the next couple of nights, I park directly in front of City Hall with my steady burns on. That's when your lights are on but do not flash. I stay there for hours at a time. I make zero attempt at being a productive officer. And being a vigilant and dedicated employee, I even take photographs to send to my supervisor to let him know that I am being visible. Needless to say, I get talked to about my attitude and told to go back to being normal. Side note. My sergeant later resigned shortly after I did, after some super shady crap happened in the department. Before he left, he gave me an award for the most literal officer ever. I still have it to this day. Super side note, I have another short story about malicious compliance when I was told to ticket people for long weeds in people yards. Same town, same department. We had an order from the chief stating that the mayor was concerned with long weeds in people's yard that presented a fire hazard. So the order comes out that the small town will be divided into quadrants and each officer is responsible for ticketing people in their grid. Now, there were multiple issues there. Firstly, the city had very few sidewalks. This meant there was usually a stretch of ground from most people's fence to the road, which was just gravel or, in most cases, weeds. If that land belonged to the homeowner, the city, who knows? No one would ever answer the damn question for me. Secondly, our city had multiple pieces of land and property. Most of them suffered from the issues that I just mentioned. Well, 9 out of 10 properties weren't in compliance either. In fact, we had multiple brush fires started during the summer and all but one occurred on city land. The hypocrisy was not lost on me, so 
I refuse to enforce the long weeds. Well, a couple weeks go by and we have an echo, term for a deceased body. A middle-aged man down on life ends it with a hunting rifle in a parking lot. My partner, a new officer with a few months on a job, is a primary for the investigation. As I try to help guide him, the mayor comes to our crime scene. He tells the chief about a house with really long weeds he saw on the way over. Chief sees me, must have been aware I was lacking in weed enforcement, and ordered me to go with the mayor. Well, the homeowner isn't home, so I tell the mayor I will investigate the matter. I ended up reviewing the city code enforcement, and there was some clause about allowing time for a homeowner to be in compliance after notification. It also had a clause about the lens that the homeowner had to be in non-compliance before being notified. Well, I had no idea how long their weeds hadn't been in compliance, so I first had to document the lens of their weeds, then I would have to follow up at a later point to ensure they had been non-compliant, at which point I would then notify them they had X amount of days to comply. Then I would follow up at that time. As you can imagine, this is really freaking stupid. However, we had a rule that any case that couldn't be closed by the end of the shift needed to go to investigations. The light bulb turns on. I then spend days driving through my grid, pulling cases for every single house. I take multiple photographs of each property which I upload into each case. I even measure the weeds. I vigorously attach all the license plates and slash or homeowner info and I type a long report narrative and copy-paste it to each separate case. I also document any of the city's properties that are non-compliant in my report so that homeowners will see it if they decide to get a copy of the reports. I then send dozens of cases to our investigations division for them to follow up since I can't handle it in one shift. I never heard a single peep about long weeds after that. Side note, I checked my wireless network in my cup card to Weeds Enforcement Officer and anyone who looked at Wi-Fi networks when I was around would see it. It stayed that way till I finally quit and went to a decent department. Hey guys, I've got a story to share that might just earn me the title of jerk on the infamous subreddit, so buckle up. Let me introduce myself, I'm Jane and my husband's name is Mike. Now we've been married for a couple of years and life's been good. Really good. But like all couples, we have our fair share of quirks. One such quirk that defines Mike is his absolute unconditional love for dogs. Now don't get me wrong, I adore dogs too, but Mike takes it to a whole new level. Our furry pals, Max and Luna, have become the center of our universe. They are a pair of lovable Labradors who've melted our hearts since they first wagged their tails into our lives. Here is where the problem arises. Max and Luna are pampered pooches, and Mike treats them like they are royalty. He takes them on long walks, plays fetch till his arm aches, and even lets them nap on a couch. I guess you could say they live the dream life of belly rubs and treats Galler. Now let's cut to the chase. The issue isn't that Mike adores our dogs, it's that he goes to crazy extents to make them happy, sometimes at the expense of our own comfort. Let me share an incident that recently went down and made me question my sanity as well as Mike's. It all began on a sunny Saturday morning. Mike had planned an outing for the four of us to the beach. Mike says to me, Hey Jane, how about a day at the beach? I'm sure Max and Luna would love to splash around in the waves. Ah, sounds like fun. You know, I'm not a big fan of sand in every nook and cranny. Can't we do something else? Oh, come on. They would be so disappointed if we didn't take them. Plus, the fresh air will do us good. All right, fine. But you're in charge of the dog's crazy beach party while I stay sand free. And after the beach, we went armed with towels, a picnic baskets, in our canine companions. The sea breeze was lovely and the dogs had a blast for licking in the water. My heart warmed as I watched their tails wag and their tongues lull with joy. But then disaster struck. Mike thought that it would be a genius idea to build a sand castle for Max and Luna. I know it sounds cute, but it turned into a sand monster extravaganza. 
complete with tourism modes and the dogs decided it was a perfect playground. And before I knew it, Max and Luna were running around like headless chickens, tracking sand all over the beach. People around us laughed and some gave us annoying glances as sand showered their picnics. Mike, I told you this would happen. Now look at this mess they have made. Oh come on, it's just a bit of sand. They are having fun. They are having fun at our expense, and I can feel sand scratching places I didn't know I had. Alright, alright, I'll get them cleaned up. With a sigh of relief, I watched Mike try to lead Max and Luna away from the sand castle. Easier said than done. The dogs were having none of it and ran circles around him, sending sand flying every which way. I said, let me handle this, you can clean up the mess later. So there I was, running after two sand-coated pups trying to grab their collars without being knocked over. At that moment I wished I had a teleportation superpower, but all I had was my futile attempts at dog wrangling. After what felt like a lifetime of sandy shenanigans, I finally managed to leash them up and return to our spot on the beach. My clothes were a sandy mess and I looked like an extra in a desert-themed movie. All I wanted was to sit down and enjoy my sandwich, but fate had other plans. Max and Luna, now slightly calmer but still excited, decided to shake themselves dry. And guess where they stood? Right next to me. Before I could react, I was caught in a crossfire of their post past doggy shakes. Ah, uh, seriously guys? I'm not a towel. Oh no, are you okay? Mike asked. Do I look okay? I am soaked in sand and seawater. Mike tried to hide a laugh but quickly composed himself when he saw the look on my face. I'm sorry honey, let me help you clean up. So there I was, drenched in sandy water, trying to wipe myself off with a beach towel that was just as sandy as me. Max and Luna, oblivious to the chaos they had caused, sat there with those innocent puppy eyes, as if to say, we just wanted to share our joy, mom. Deep down, I knew they were just dogs doing what dogs do, but in that moment, I couldn't help but feel a little resentful towards Mike for his grand sandcastle idea. As we packed up to leave the beach, Mike took charge of the dog's cleanup. He says, fear not, my love. I shall cleanse our fur babies of their sandy sins. You better bring them back without a grain of sand. With that, Mike marched towards the ocean, Max and Luna in tow, and he managed to convince them to take a quick dip, and I watched as he splashed water on them, hoping it would wash away the mess. There you go, my sandy buddies. All clean now. He looked back at me, a grin on his face as if he'd just won the Nopal Prize for a doggy bath. But when Max and Luna shook themselves dry once again, I saw his confidence crumble like a sandcastle hit by a wave. Oh no, not again. By now the people around us were chuckling and some even offered their sympathies. Having witnessed the comedic doggy cleanup, I couldn't help but join in on the laughter. The scene was too ridiculous not to find humor in it. After what felt like an eternity of failed attempts at getting rid of the sand, Mike finally managed to lead the still slightly sandy dogs back to our spot. I give up. They are officially honorary sandbags now. I tell him, well, you did your best. Let's just pack up and head home before more chaos ensues. Mike nodded and with an air of defeat, we gathered our belongings and said goodbye to the beach. I couldn't help but chuckle at the whole situation and despite the sandstorm, it had been a day full of adventure and laughter. As we drove home, Max and Luna snoozed contentedly in the backseat, probably dreaming of their sandy escapades. So, Reddit friends, am I the jerk for letting Mike go ahead with a sandcastle plan? Maybe, but in the grand scheme of things, the joy and love our dogs bring to our lives make it all worth it. Life with them is messy, but it's also a beachy blast. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.